Hello and welcome to another Knitting Pod. I'm Lena and I'm so happy to be sitting down with you today. It is the middle of June and it sure feels like it. I am starting to feel like maybe we never moved from Texas because it is so hot here. I hate to complain when um, some of you might be dealing with substantially warmer weather, but I am just... I am not cut out for the heat. It is not fun. I hate not being able to go outside very much. And um, anyway, I miss hiking and all that good stuff, but you know, it's more time to knit. So I definitely have a lot to share with you guys today. So if you're up for that, let's go ahead and get started. Last week, I told you that I had cast on a summery tea because you can't fight nature, so you might as well knit something that you can wear in the summer. It is the Garter Glide Tee by James N. Watts. Um, it's kind of scraggly looking, but I finished the front panel. This is a fingering weight summer tee that um, is knit in pieces and seamed together. And it has an interesting construction in that it is knit vertically so you start on one side and you knit all the way across um, you start with the little sleeve in his sample he's done kind of a color blocking style so he did the little sleeve in one color the body in another color etc i really wanted it to just have one color but i was worried because i was adding a lot of length that i wouldn't be able to finish it in this beautiful variegated colorway by farmer's daughter fiber um, so in the center, you'll see that there was a, I added a solid, but because it's so matched in tone, I don't think it stands out that much. And I like it that way. Um, real quick. Also, I have really, really made an effort to start doing show notes. So if I don't tell you something that you want to know, hopefully it'll be in the show notes. It's very hard for me to be disciplined enough to do that but I'm trying so that you have more resources to look up the things I talk about. Anyway, back to this tea. I finished the first, um, the front panel pretty quickly. I would say it flew by, honestly. Where I ran into some trouble, and I'm, I'm gonna end up blocking my face, but I'm gonna hold it like this so you can see. Where I ran into trouble was making sure that this side and this side are completely symmetrical. And I really tried to set myself up for success by putting in stitch markers. I might have taken them off. Yeah. But for instance, you can see, um, here's a stitch marker. This is from here, from this red stitch marker to this yellow stitch marker was where all the rows I knit without increasing or decreasing on this side. Because he gives you a row count. So for my size, I believe it was like 47 garter stitch rows. It's just really hard when you get to, in garter, to know if you're at 47 or 48. And so I was really trying to set myself up for success with stitch markers, but it still was a little bit difficult for me to see and just the natural, the nature of a hand knit garment, your tension fluctuates a little and it just, it was so hard for me to see if both sides were symmetrical. And when I got to the second side, I felt like if I knit to the full row count, it looked like it was gonna be too big. So it just, it slowed down my momentum because I kept thinking, I, I feel like it's gonna be a lopsided garment. And I kept trying to like line up the panels by folding them and doing all this mental gymnastics. It ended up being fine, but that definitely slowed my momentum down. And then a kicker is that you're doing the back panel, which also has the same pieces mirrored. And your eyes started getting scared that that wasn't gonna line up right. And then when I went to seam it, it wasn't gonna fit together perfectly. All that to say, this is the part of having a garment knit flat like this that's a little bit trickier and becomes, you know, something you have to, you have to just make sure you're doing it right. I don't know, maybe at the end, because it's such an, has so much positive ease, it won't matter that much, but still, I feel like 
it will matter to me. I will know if it's like one side is like longer than the other. Anyway, so all that being said, I did finish this front panel. I just decided to stop letting perfection be, you know, the enemy of just making progress. And I just decide to believe in my own eyeballs and just bind off when I felt like it was the, you know, the right amount of rows. And then I cast on the back panel. So this is the back panel. It is not an exact mirror of the front. There is not a V in the back. There's also, I think, such lovely, um, a like increase in the bottom hem so that you get a little more coverage on your bum because obviously when your body as it should go out like this that that fabric is going to lift up to cover so it's nice to have a little extra so I think that's a very thoughtful detail and then I believe the top is fairly flat across to give you a normal v-neck and then you just knit across. I have kind of slowed down. If I had continued a pace of the front panel, I really think I would have been done by now. But I just, like I said, that um, the, the symmetry issue kind of slowed me down and that's okay. I always remind myself that like, you know, the momentum you have at the beginning of a project is different in the middle. Um, and that's okay. We're not meant to just churn and burn through these projects. So I pick this up when I feel like it. It's fantastic on the go knitting, like I said last time, especially at this point in the back panel. It's just a lot of back and forth garter stitch, which is delightful. I love it. Um, this colorway is just so pretty. I feel like you really get a beautiful um sense of what this fiber this uh skein knits up as right here and i love how unpredictable and beautiful the color movement is it feels like an impressionist painting caitlin had left a message saying and it reminded her of like a monet painting and i was like yes how did that not occur to me that is exactly what this reminds me of like lily pads you know that painting with the lily pads it just has that watercolor effect and this is what we pay you know good money for with hand painted hand dyed yarn that's um so expensive but it's just you cannot get this kind of effect any other way so i am loving watching the skein knit up and i feel like it'll be a beautiful garment that i can wear a ton layer a ton and kind of feel like is slightly elevated because of the silk content. It has this beautiful sheen and just looks so, it's, what I really like about this fiber for this garment is this garment has a very dress down, um, kind of, what's the word, raw, raw edge. I love the raw edge of the hem. It doesn't have a very finished, you know, I-cord bow border or, you know, ribbing or anything that would make it look finished. It has that raw edge and rawness to it, but the silk content adds the, a contrast to that rawness that I really, really like. So last week I had talked about fibers being matched to the garment and the overall look, and I feel like this fiber just really matched the look I was going for, and I'm really happy with it so far. I hope the length is good and I don't have to add a strip around the bottom because that would totally, you know, defeat the purpose of my, um, my, um, the look I was going for. Sorry, I got distracted when I picked up my coffee because I never drink coffee when I'm taping, but I don't know why. It's very cl cloudy today and it's making me feel cozy even though it's like 80 degrees outside. Um, so I'm still drinking coffee. I love coffee, you guys. I love coffee so much and I needed a couple more sips of a cup. Also, I have to address this cup real quick. I know this is off topic, but I would be doing you guys a disservice if I didn't point it out as I'm holding it. This is the Ember mug that my lovely family got me for my birthday. I used to just I'm the kind of person, I think it's because 
I have Indian heritage that I need my coffee to be hot. So I was always the person begging whoever walked by while I was knitting to heat up my coffee in the microwave. And they were always so sweet. They would always heat it up and bring it back to me. But inevitably, you know, we don't chug our coffee. So it would get cold again. And so they got this mug for me. It is, like I said, the Ember mug. It is a heated mug. So it doesn't feel hot, but it has a little charging stand and it is a miracle. It stays such a perfect temperature. You can shift, you can kind of play with the temperature. In fact, it's so effective that I kept burning my mouth. So I had to turn the temperature down, but I think this is the best gift for someone who loves coffee and knitting because it works and it is pricey for a mug. I think it's like $130 or something, but it is worth every penny. If you are a homebody like me, if you love coffee and you love hot coffee, this is your girl. I mean, look and look at that gorgeous rose gold color. It comes in different colors, but anyway, okay. Commercial over. Um, but I cannot live without that mug. I'm so spoiled. Like when I went to Dallas to visit my family and I didn't have my coffee mug, this one, it just felt so weird to have to heat up my coffee all the time. Anyway, back to knitting. That is that with the Garter Glide Tee. Loving this project so far. Definitely a little bit on the back burner because I'm working on a few other things. I'm wrapping up a shawl that I'm not gonna show you today because I will be done with it next week and I'd rather you see it in all its glory because right now there are so many stitches that I cannot stretch it out and it's all squinched up and it just does this beauty a disservice. So we're gonna wait till it's off the needles and wet blocked so that you can see it in all its beautiful glory. But fear not, I have a very fun new cast on to share with you guys, okay. You guys know that if you've been with me, if you're new, you probably don't know that I have only as big of a knitter as I am. I mean, knitting is what is running through my mind 24 hours a day. I dream about yarn. I wake up thinking about yarn. It's the healthiest relationship in my life. I love it so much. Anyway, um, and I love to knit shawls and sweaters and tops and hats. I love hats. Um, but I just have never caught the sock knitting bug and I really want it. I'm trying to catch it. Breathe on me, sock knitters. Infect me with your sock knitting obsession. So I decided the universe is trying to get me to try again. So the only sock I've ever knit is the Painting Brick Sock by Stephen West my beloved Stephen West. It was a joy to knit that sock. I really liked it. My only issue was, even though I had really tried to meet every, you know, sizing tick box, they are too big. And it was a little bit disappointing because, you know, you put so much effort into it and then they don't fit like you want. And just like anything else, you want your piece to fit like you want it to fit. Um, but I decided that just can't be a reason to never try again. And like I said, I felt like the universe was sending me signs. Sign number one was that Stephen West is doing his mystery sock along. Um, of course, I watched his video on YouTube and I was so, you know, jazzed in my mind to do it. And then I realized, you know what? I have one hand knit sock to my name and I need it to be my neck sock to be a little more basic while I still hammer out fit issues. And I think sometimes when you add, one of you had said this to me, you know, when you're adding fancy stuff to your sock, it's hard to get the sizing just right on those because you might not know exactly the stitch count that works for you. And when you're adding cables and color work and all this stuff, it tends to loosen it up. And since I, am a loose, incredibly loose knitter apparently. Um, maybe I should work on nailing a basic sock before I enter into mystery sock along territory. So I decided as much as I am tempted to jump on the bandwagon because the energy of a Stephen West mystery knit along is so much fun, maybe not. 
Okay, so I accepted that I'm not going to be on the Stephen West bandwagon in July. If you are, I cannot wait to watch because it's so much fun to see what crazy stuff he comes up with. Um, number two, this is the thing that really pushed me over. The designer Summer Lee, she is super just, I think she exclusively designs socks. And Instagram fed me a little um, reel or some video of hers where she says, um, basic socks don't have to be boring or something to that extent. And the socks that were popping up in the little video were just, I mean, they were singing my song. And I just thought instantly, I have to make. It was that thunderstruck feeling that I love so much. Like last week I was talking about how difficult of a time I was having settling on the next top I wanted to knit. This was the exact opposite. This is my favorite thing is when it's like a, being struck by the bolt of lightning that you know you wanna make this and you can't wait to start. That's how I felt. I'm putting up pictures so you can see the exact pictures that just captured my heart. Um, and then I just fell down the Summerlee rabbit hole. And you guys, she and I are kindred spirits. I feel so happy that I, I have seen her before, but I never was like caught that itch. But she loves color and her color, the way she uses color is very similar the, to the way I like to use color. So instantly I just could not stop scrolling her Ravelry and I could not pick. It was like an embarrassment of riches and how do you pick the one you're gonna cast on? Um, the ones I was between were, one of them that I loved was the Summerland sock. I'm gonna pull the picture up so that I can um, see what you're seeing. The Summerland socks are exactly what um, the name suggests. Sorry, that's my coffee maker rinsing out. Um, bright and vivid and so happy. It just makes you feel like getting a glass of lemonade and sitting on a pool chair and knitting. Um, just, I love her use of color. She does such a good job of balancing the brightness with a toned down, like the balance of bright and mellow just equals perfect. If you go so bright sometimes that it's just kind of looks juvenile, I think it looks a little more elevated when you use brights and then they have something earthy to bring them down to, down to earth. So I love these. Um, the other ones I loved were just so adorable and charming were the pocket socks. Same really gorgeous use of color, especially that uh, more taupey sock with the mint seafoam pop. Oh my gosh, I'm obsessed with this color combination. I feel like using it in everything right now. It just, it's so fresh and like, clean but fun I, it's just it's perfect her use of color is so good and i just love how the bodies of the socks are actually quite simple it's just so there's not a lot of you know i need to memorize a stitch pattern great for on the go summer knitting so i really fell down the summerly rabbit hole i started watching her youtube videos and much to my glee i love her the way she talks and it's just a very easy video to watch sometimes you know when you like a designer and then when you're listening to them there's maybe not that connection but i really enjoyed watching a few of her youtube videos so which one did i finally land on neither one of those actually i landed on the slouch set and another thing i should say about her that i really appreciated is most of her patterns, there are $7 US and they're not just a single sock pattern. They are a set of related sock, like a theme. So you can really mix and match and say, you know, my daughter was like, oh, I want one of those. It's like, I can use the same pattern and tweak it and use the cable leg instead of the plain leg or use the textured leg instead of the plain leg. So if I'm making her one, I don't have to buy a whole nother sock pattern. 
and I'm not bored. I can try a different aspect. She gives you so many options and I really think that's a very generous thing as a sock knit designer because you know they're smaller and you can churn out a few extras but it's nice that one pattern gives you all these mix and match options so i really appreciate that about her i ended up on the slouch because i like the look of birkenstocks and socks together that is my aesthetic that is how i dress in the summer i live in a very casual um, town where if you are dressed up people are going to look at you kind of sideways like you're definitely not from here everybody wears the most casual clothes and I am here for it. I love casual. So to me, it's some self-expression in the summer when it's harder to grab a shawl because it's freaking hot outside. You're not wearing your hand knit sweater that makes you feel like your best self. To me, my dream is to have a drawer full of hand knit socks that I can mix and match with my Birkenstocks and feel like me. I just, I feel like even if I'm wearing the same black leggings and Aviator Nation sweatshirt that everybody else is, I have my hand knit socks on that make my outfit look completely bonkers and reflective of myself. So that is one real motivation for me to master the fit of these socks. So because I tend to be a loose knitter, I figured maybe the slouch sock will fit well in the cuff and naturally be a little looser in the body of the leg and that's kind of the look of it and i'm just kind of leaning into that with my loose knitting style anyway and i think that slouchiness looks just so cute with birkenstock so without further ado let me show you the cute little cuff that i have so far well the cuff is done but this is the leg i have so far this is, I took inspiration from her Summerland socks. She had one sock with a super colorful striped cuff and toe, and then the body was just plain stockinette in a really basic, you know, neutral color. And I love that look because then this cuff just is singing and I don't look like I just walked out of a clown car because the whole body is this striped. So the, the leg and the foot are really simple in this gray color. And this cuff just sings because it's so much fun. I don't know whether it's because we are so engrossed in the NBA Finals right now and the Celtics are playing, but this Celtics green is just, I am obsessed with green. Green and that seafoam color, I don't know. They are coming for hot pink, which is rude, but it's just the truth of what's happening right now. So I wanted the most, um, you know, next to skin color to be that gorgeous pop of grassy Celtics green. Then I have these beautiful, rich colors. I wish I had, these are all just scraps I had, not scraps. These are all half used skeins I have in my stash which is my favorite way to make use of my stashes to be able to insert pops of color. But I really need to procure a beautiful sky blue that's not variegated, just a solid sky blue. I think that would have been really beautiful in this, but I didn't want to buy a whole skein and my this yarn shop that I went to, the one that's right next door to me, they don't have the little 10 gram sock do you know what I mean? The little minis. Those are so great because you don't feel guilty spending five bucks and getting one of those and it adds a color pop. But I didn't have that. Um, this one actually is the dye or this green was one of those mini 10 grams. What's it? That South African cow cowgirl blues. I think that's what it's called. Um, this is cowgirl blues. I don't know what I forgot the color name, but I really need a blue. So anyway, and then this is Cascade Heritage. It is a very well-priced sock yarn. It's like on the internet, I think it was $10. At my store, it was, I think, 11 or 12 or maybe even 13. I, the price went up on this guy because I remember a couple, like a year or two ago, it was $11 at my local yarn shop. Let me take out the little thing. It is, um, like I said, Cascade Heritage, 75% Superwash Merino, 25% Nylon. And yes, this was $13. 
I know online it's less expensive. Um, I don't know what the colorway is. It just has a number, 5681. It's just a really simple gray. They, I would have loved it if it was a bit of a warmer gray, but they didn't have it. This is like a, it's a much cooler gray, which I tend to gravitate, I think just because of my skin color, to warmer colors. This is just a really flat gray. And um, they have Malabrigo um, in their ultimate sock base next to this at the store. And all of the Malabrigo are very tonal. Even their solids are very tonal. So there's, uh, when you're looking at the stockinette, knit up yarn it just looks very you know there's a lot of variation in the color and in this case because i was going for these really bright pops i wanted the body to be absolutely flat so i was happy to find a very flat color you know that this is what i love about how much yarn there is out there sometimes you want something with that solid but with more tones in it this time I didn't, and there's just, you know, we have so many yarns to choose from, I love it. So I was very happy with this sock yarn. The um, brand Lang, um, they have a, a, a base called Jawal on Woolen Company. Oh my gosh, their colors are so, so pretty, but I was so swept up in my sock fever that I didn't have time for a yarn delivery. I needed to start it now so this was all in the last two days i just cast on that sock yesterday and i am loving it so let's talk about the logistics putting aside the beauty of the colors i measured the ball of my foot and i am in eight and a half inches around my foot now i have a very weird situation i am not a very tall person at all I think I'm like five, three and a half. I used to think I was five, four, but I'm not. And yes, I'm going to say a half because I'm clinging, y'all, I'm clinging. But I wear a size 11 shoe, super cute. Every girl dreams of having a giant foot and not growing to be five foot four, but don't be jealous. So I have this giant, long, flat foot, but my ankle and my calves are really, really thin. So. I think what happens is the measurement of my foot is not what is proportional to my calf. So even though the eight and a half in Summer Lee's design, the eight inches was a medium. So I was even going down. When I cast on a medium and started, it was enormous. It was like my foot was, my calf was swimming in it. So I ripped it out and cast on a small, and now I'm done with the cuff, and even still, it's too loose. So I'm not ripping it out, okay? I'm just gonna continue on. I am going to make a mental note that in the future, I need to make the kid size probably if I want the calf to be really tight, because I don't want to drop down below a size one, I feel like the fabric might be too dense, so I'd rather try to drop down in size. And I figure, look, I'm gonna give myself grace. I'm just in the sizing experimentation phase of so becoming a sock knitter. And I think some of you had said this to me the last time we talked about socks, that you kind of do just have to make a few pairs and see what works for you. There's so many um, permutations of, cuffs and toes and heels and there's just every designer has their own methodology with some practice just like with anything else you kind of figure out what works for you so we're starting here we're not pressuring ourselves to be perfect my cheat is going to be elastic thread so i use that in my hats a lot of times i kind of struggle with the same thing with my hats it's a goldilocks zone right this one's too hot tight this one's too loose I think a cheat is running that clear elastic thread through your finished ribbing and you can literally cinch it and tie a little knot. Maybe this isn't what, you know, a super skilled knitter would do, but this is my cheat to make it feel nice and snug the way I want it. And I can literally snip out that elastic and pull it out if it, you know, by the end of the evening, I'm like, ah, that feels a little too tight. So I'm gonna do the same thing 
with my socks. I haven't tried it yet. I need the body of this sock to be a little longer. It's definitely too wide for me to make, to have a like nice fitted body of the leg too. Um, but I'm going to leave it. It's supposed to be slouchy anywhere. I'm really glad in this slouch, slouchy sock, she says to go up to a US 2 for the leg of the sock, but I did not do that because I'm already feeling like it's too big. So I stuck with the one and I feel like that's perfect for me. I love how crisp and clean that um, stock and net stitch looks, you guys. Oh my gosh, it's so pretty. I had a really hard time deciding between the slouch sock and the wide rib sock also of hers. I love the wide rib, the look of it. It's so pretty and I like the way the wide rib that goes the whole way down looks with stripes, but I had to end up picking one, so I picked this one to start. My, my hope and prayer is that I love this process and, and become just an obsessive sock knitter like so many of you are. Um, I just, it's so fun to be able to knit socks for people you love also. Like I could really imagine knitting socks for my family and letting them pick the colors they want. Like my daughter obviously was just thrilled to see something so bright and colorful. Um, what else, what else? Um, I was up in the air when I was at the store buying the Cascade Heritage. Um, I was really tempted to buy the nine inch shorties for this project so to avoid magic loop. But I'm, this is why it's so lovely if you can try things out. I pulled them off and out of the little package and oh my gosh, <laughs> they are absurd. Like the nine inch, I felt like there wasn't even enough cord to feel like I was getting a nice angle in my knitting. And to me, when you start changing those tiny things like the angle at which you hold, that's when you get stress in your hands. So I'm really glad I tried them out because I did not like the nine inch shorties. And I figured, you know, in my hopes to become a sock knitter, I really, you know, I love cables. I really wanna make a cabled sock. And I think it would be really tricky to cable without a cable needle with those tiny nine inch midget needles. So I decided to just go with Magic Loop. Um, you know, it's ironic because lately I've been telling you guys how much I like the shorties for sleeves. Well, those are different. Like you can um, mix and match the cord length and the tip length with the shorty set in a way that works in, and with this, especially because I'm going to have to go down to such a small circumference, I feel like nine inches is just barely going to be small enough. And that's just not going to be comfortable with me, for me. So this is the first time I've done Magic Loop in a hot second. And once you get back past that first couple rounds, it's been great. I've had no complaints. It's um, There's a tiny bit of laddering, but I don't think that's going to matter too much. Um, it's just inevitable because when you're in magic loop, let me show you. When you're in magic loop, inevitably there's going to be a little pulling right here, right? Especially in the ribbing, there's a little pulling and it's going to make a little bit of uh, laddering. But I think when you wet block and you wear it, nobody is going to see that, okay? If someone is lying on the ground at calf level, you got bigger problems than laddering. So I'm not too worried about that. Um, I do wonder if I should have gone down to a double zero for the ribbing. There's so many ways to experiment with tweaking, but I feared that it would like really screw up the gauge. But if you look at the difference, this is a one in ribbing and this is a one in stock and now you can just see how different the stitches look. Okay. I'm going on and on about socks. Maybe I, there's hope for me yet to turn into a sock knitter because I have been obsessing. Every other thing I'm working on has taken a back seat because I'm obsessed. And I really, again, it's hot outside. Say we're gonna drive to the mountains, which we're gonna do in a couple of weeks for a little vacation. 
I don't want to sit in the car with a giant shawl on my lap, roasting in the sun, knitting. That is just contributing to a sweltering situation. But if you're knitting a sock, you're just cute. You're cute with your little summer outfit on, knitting a sock, and you're not you're not covered in the body of whatever you're knitting. And I feel like this is just light and easy and fun to travel with. So I'm gonna try my darndest and enjoy this and not get too disappointed if it doesn't fit perfectly, but just to keep trying and experimenting. I'm a little nervous to get to the heel because her heel was different than the heel I did with Stephen West in the one sock I have knit, but I figure She's probably a fantastic pattern designer and writer because everybody loves her. Um, and usually, you know, the kinks get worked out when a pattern designer becomes really well-known and well-loved. Well okay, guys, that is all the hand knits I've got to show you today. Come back next week to see my beautiful shawl. I'm gonna leave that as a little teaser out there. Moving on, what is life like these days? Oh my gosh, it's summer vacation here. We are fully in the hectic summer um, energy, which has been fun. I've loved, I've loved having my kids around more in the evenings. They're very busy during the days, but um, they're very chill in the evening, so that's been lovely. My son is going to a sleepaway camp this Sunday, which is a huge bummer. I've loved having him around for a couple of weeks. I feel like, no, it was like a solid month where he wasn't traveling. The month before that, he was traveling so much, I felt like I barely saw him. And now I'm spoiled and he's gonna leave. And of course he's leaving. He has to be dropped off on Father's Day which is like really like he was traveling for Mother's Day and ruined my Mother's Day and now he's gonna ruin Father's Day, but oh well. You know, as they get older, they have so much of their own stuff going on. So he's gone next week, he'll be back next weekend and then he's gone again the next week. Um, but we watched Mrs. Doubtfire the other day, the old Robin Williams movie from the 90s and it was so fun. Last week I told you guys how much we're enjoying watching movies and TV together as a family and this was just such a fun throwback. It reminded me of being 13 again and watching it in the theater and Robin Williams is just so delightful and they just got such a kick out of it. So highly recommend that. Um, what else have we been watching? Oh, we watched Inside Out because feel like a horrible parent. Apparently my daughter had never seen it. I remember seeing it, but she wasn't there. I don't know, I don't know how that happened, but she had never seen it. She absolutely loved it. And today Inside Out 2 comes out. So I hope maybe when my son is out of town next week, it'll be something we do together. Um, we'll go to the theater and have a little girl's day. That would be really fun. But that movie is so much fun. And I actually think it, there's so much value in it for kids and adults to remember that, you know, those emotions inside of us that are so sometimes overwhelming and feel like they have a life of their own. Like, it's so nice to kind of conceptualize them as these characters in our head so that we don't identify so fully with them, especially for my daughter. She's 10 and very, very typical of this age, I think, is a lot of emotional variability, to say the least. If you have a 10, 11, 12 year old, I don't have to tell you that there's a lot of this action. I mean, it's almost comical because and my son and I were giggling because my daughter was like, oh my God, disgust and anger are so funny, the characters in the movie. And we looked at each other like, yeah, they're hilarious. Those are like her dominant um, emotions these days. But it just, it was, it's a fun way to give them a little emotional awareness. And I think installment two sees our main character transitioning to teendom and all its new emotions. So I feel like there is not only entertainment, but a little parenting value there too. So, and Dr. Lisa Damore, who is a very well-known child psychiatrist who actually lives here in Colorado, 
was the consultant for that movie, which is so cool. Um, she's just incredible. She wrote a book about teenage emotion recently that I think is great and helps you as a parent kind of um, parse out what is normal teenage emotional ups and downs and what is not normal. So I think her work is so great and it's an awesome resource that they used to make the movie actually reflective of what our biology is. This is the risk of my coffee being here is that even though I don't technically need to take a sip, I just want to take a sip. Okay, let's talk about, oh, actually, you know, before we talk about books, while we're talking about emotional stuff, I came across this little tidbit that I really wanted to share with you guys because I read it last Sunday. And since then, it's stuck in my brain and it's been so incredibly helpful. And I just wanted to share it with you guys because maybe you'll find it as helpful as I did. Because sometimes these little mental tweaks can be so impactful and they seem so silly. When I read this, I thought, okay, that doesn't seem like it's gonna do much, but it really did. And this is the tweak. Let me tell you first where I read it. I read it in Maria Shriver's Sunday newsletter. I don't know how I signed up for this, but I get her Sunday newsletter. And I clicked on one of the links to one of the articles and it was written by, I will leave all this in the show notes, okay? Because this author, it's, I forgot her name. Maybe, no, I didn't write it down, but it'll be in the show notes. I did not make this up. So I don't want it to be miscredited. Um, she basically said, you know, we all have this just incredibly strong inner critic in our head that just truly has a life of its own. And there's just almost nothing we do, at least I'll speak for myself, that that inner critic doesn't just instantly speak up. For instance, if I wanted to start a podcast, who's going to watch your podcast? Oh my God, you don't even have an Instagram. Why would you make a podcast? There's a bazillion podcasts out there. Why do you think? And all that dialogue, right? It's so constant that we feel like it's actually our voice and it's not. It is a completely toxic, negative presence that's just constantly been there with us, but it's not us. And what her tip was, and it's not just for an inner critic, it's for the, let me tell you the trick before I keep going. The trick is, oh, how human of me. Just to say that every time you have that criticism in your head, oh, how human of me. For instance, I've had a busy day. I haven't really been with my kids all day. They come home and despite the fact that they haven't been there all day and I miss them and before they came home, I was thinking about them and I couldn't wait to hear about their days. When they get home within five minutes, I'm like, why do you leave your stuff everywhere? Oh my gosh, can you not use the mudroom? Why is the mudroom even there? And I snap at them and I ruin the mood and they storm off, okay? And this hypothetical, purely hypothetical. Um, they storm off and I'm left thinking, oh my God, what kind of a mom? You miss them all day, but the minute they walk in, you're barking at them. And what's the difference if they leave their bag on the counter for five minutes? Instead of going down that road, there's that moment where we disrupt that train of negativity and beating ourselves up with, oh, how human. Oh, how human it is to be irritated when you spent the whole morning tidying up that they come in and don't even recognize it and throw their stuff everywhere. Oh, how human it is to be irritated with my partner who of course carries so much weight of what they do, but they left all the dirty dishes in the sink. Whatever it is, I found that thinking that thought, oh, how human of me, not only does it give me distance, like it, it distances all the emotions from that inner self, the true calm, sound part of me, it gives me distance, but it also gives me compassion for myself that everyone in the same situation would likely have the same reaction because so much of our negative dialogue is almost this 
a, a better mother wouldn't have had that reaction. A better friend wouldn't have had that reaction. That's not true. All these reactions are inside every one of us and we might not be sharing them. Nobody's posting them on Instagram. Very few people are sending you a text message. Oh my God, I just snapped at my kids. I feel so bad. And if they did, you'd say, oh my God, it's just because you had a rough day. It's not that big of a deal. Just go apologize and start over. There's something of that, oh, how human of me that makes you feel just part of the human race and you get to have grace just like you would give grace to your most beloved friend or child or partner or whoever you love the most, you would never want them to beat themselves up. And there is something about this tiny little trick that really helps me stop that negative train that is just like barreling in your mind. It just helps stop it and kind of give you like a little perspective shift Try it and let me know if that works. I'm going to leave a link to the article. I hope you can click through to the article. I don't know if it requires a subscription or something like that, but you can I'll also leave a link to this author's book because she wrote a whole book um, kind of about her struggle with imposter syndrome and all even through all her extremely successful career achievements, she kept having these negative thoughts in her head and this little trick helped her stop it. And I'm telling you, it seems like nothing, but actually is quite effective. Okay, enough of that. What have I been reading? I read a lovely book. Last week I told you I read You Are Here by David Nichols and loved it so much that I just wanted to read more books like that. And I got really lucky that Libby delivered a book that I've had in my queue forever and I almost took it out of my queue because one of my friends that read it, a dear friend of mine who loves to read as much as I do, didn't like it. Um, and I'm so glad I didn't because it just goes to show what somebody might not like, you might love. It is Good Material by Dolly Alderton and it's gotten a lot of hype because I think it was a somebody's book club pick, somebody that, you know, Reese Witherspoon or somebody. Um, she's a British author and I loved this book. It was such a perfect follow-up to You Are Here because it is that same British dry sensibility that is so charming and I absolutely love. There is this, I don't know if you know, the voice I'm talking about, but just this, it reminded me of Baby Reindeer, that drama on Netflix that's super serious, but has a lot of humor in it. It reminded me of that so much. The comedian in that um, show and the narrator of Good Material in my head were the same person. I love that it's narrated by a man, but written by a woman. I think she just nailed a male point of view and really resisted falling falling into just straight up stereotypes about men and women. I really enjoyed this book. I laughed out loud and yet it it landed so emotionally you're you're going through a really really difficult time with this main character but it's written with humor and levity and just you just feel like you're along for this this person's emotional journey through this breakup. And my friend thought it was really, by the end, annoying. Like, he really annoyed her. He didn't annoy me at all. I don't know. I just thought he was so relatable. Uh, highly recommend this book. Loved the cover art, by the way. Loved the colors on this cover art. I think it would be a really fun um like if you read it and knit a pair of socks inspired by the colors, I think that'd be really fun. Anyway, to keep with our socks theme. Um, highly recommend Dolly Alderton's Good Material. She's adorable. So happy for her success in the United States. Apparently very well known in the UK, but not as much here. But now I think that's changed because this book was awesome. Now, here's my conundrum, okay? I said this, sorry, my nose is itching. The allergies have been 
atrocious here. There's this cottonwood kind of tree and all the cotton is just like floating around. It's almost ironic because it looks like snow, but it's like 80 degrees, so it's most certainly not snow. And it just lacks all the delightfulness of snow. It just makes your nose and your eyes itch like crazy. But back to the books. I told you guys last week that I'm in this very light, like lighter phase of reading. I just want to read things that are a little on the lighter side, but not too light. Like I could not finish that Jennifer Weiner book, Big Summer, even though I got to like 65% through. I just found it unbearable by then and I tossed it and I am so glad I did. It was too light. Um, so I like these English books that I'm reading right now that are like funny but have depth. However, one of my favorite books of all time, like if you ask me to list from my consciousness just like of all time, all the books I've read, this would land in the top five. It is The Story of Edgar Sattel by David Robleski. And bonus points for any of you who have read it, please tell me if you read it because I just loved everything about this book. It's like imprinted in my mind, the look of the hardcover, the feel of the pages, the feeling of reading it, the feeling of just being pulled into the story because it's so beautifully written. However, it is extremely long. It's like 700 some odd pages. I even got tickets to watch, see him speak when he was doing, when he was traveling for this book. And it was such an honor because he's just brilliant, David Robleski. And at the time when I saw him speak, he was discussing, he was talking about the, he wanted to write a prequel. He was in the process of writing a prequel. I think this was like 15 or 20 years ago. And I waited and waited for that prequel and it never came. Well, y'all, it just came. It's called Familiaris, I believe. I can't even remember. I think that's what it's called. And David Robleski finally released it and it's Oprah's Book Club, of course. Oprah's Book Club pick for the summer because it's like 800 pages long or something crazy like that. Now, this is my conundrum. I was talking to my family about this last night. The first part of the conundrum is because it's been 20 years since I read the story of Edgar Sattel and I loved it so much, I almost want to reread it in preparation to read the second one. And these two points are kind of intertwining. Like I almost am looking so forward to reading the second, this Familiaris, that I don't want to read it. It's like I want to save it. And it's so counterintuitive. And I was trying to explain this feeling and my kids were like, yeah, no, we don't understand that. Like if a book comes out that we've been excited to read, they want to start reading it the second it comes out. But I have this feeling of like, then it'll be done and then I won't have it to look forward to. I don't know. I'm the person that if I got a chocolate bar, I'll eat it like super slowly. Like my husband will just like shovel it in his face and be done. I'll eat it like tiny nibbles at a time because I don't want it to end. So I think it's something like that psychology behind it. So I don't know. It's like, I know it's not going to be a light summer read, like the ones I want to read and I don't want to read it because then it'll be over. I'm just having all these conflicted thoughts. If you're still here right now, you really love me because I am officially just stream of consciousness. What the crazy in my brain, it's coming out of my mouth right now. Um, so I don't know what to do. You guys can tell me right now. I have nothing to read. It's such a disappointment. Libby is giving me nothing. I'm waiting for Save Me the Plums by Ruth Reichel and I'm first in line and this person just will not return their copy and it's pissing me off. I'm like, please return it so I can read it because that's the book I really want to read right now. It would be a beautiful summer read. <sighs> but we're all, we're just ignoring the David Robleski shaped elephant in the room that there's basically 1400 pages of David Robleski that I could be reading, but I'm not because I can't decide when the perfect time to read that book is. Okay. I'm gonna stop talking because I am going off the rails here. I hope you have a lovely weekend. I am very excited because 
our dear friends who spend a lot of time in Crested Butte and have been there for like three or four weeks are back and they're coming over tonight. So I cannot wait to see them. I've missed them so much and I've missed their baby so much. He's gonna be huge compared to the last time I see him. So I'm, and then some friends of ours from Texas are visiting. They have a tournament, their kiddo has a tournament in Denver and they're coming over tomorrow night. So I'm very excited to see them because it's been like four and a half years since we saw them. So I'm really, really excited. Their daughter, so it's the dad and the daughter who are coming. And the daughter and my daughter used to be such good friends, but when we moved, they didn't stay in touch. So I'm really curious actually what they'll be like in person. I'm a little nervous because I'm sure they'll be, they probably don't have as much recollection of how good of friends they were then, but um, I'm really excited to see that little relationship rekindled. So, okay, that's what I'm up to. There's gonna be a lot of sock knitting. Maybe I'll have a mostly completed sock for you guys next week. I hope you have a lovely fiber-filled weekend. Go enjoy your summer and I will see you next week. Bye.